Today we've got a J50 on the bench. It's actually a J50 Deluxe in this time period. Another Gibson. This is, well, it's a little more recent. It was made between 1973 and 75, according to online serial number sources. The mid-70s aren't the most esteemed years for American acoustic guitar industry, to say the least. But, as always, it's best not to judge by the date alone, because there are some gems, always, amongst the duds. And this one got played, you know. That's frequently a good sign. Again, that strange wear pattern here that, you know, happens between the pickguard and the bridge. How did it get there? Who gave it permission? The J50. It's like a J45, plus an additional 5. The extra 5 is a big deal, too. Or not. It really just means the guitar has a natural top, rather than a shaded sunburst finish. According to some, it also means they used better quality wood for the top, because they couldn't hide anything under the paint. I'm not sure anyone at the factory was too concerned at that era, you know. They were buying freight cars worth of Sitka spruce, and it all looked pretty good, you know. Very similar looking stuff for all the guitars. During this era, starting around 1969, someone at Gibson, possibly a newish executive, because they had just recently been purchased by um, an international conglomerate called Norlin, which uh, was headquartered in Panama, of all places. And, you know, they owned breweries in South America and the rights to the Moog synthesizer. Um, but they decided that their flagship guitar should look more like Martin's, for some reason. And the shape of the body was changed to this straight-shouldered look from the distinctive slope shoulders they'd had for 35 years previous. These also have a longer scale length, too. They're 25 and a half inches, opposed to the 24 and 3 quarters. Again, similar to Martin's. What's the reason? Don't know. This guitar seems to have been sold by Bill Lewis Music in Vancouver, British Columbia, not Washington. Bill's kind of a big name. Uh, he was a flamenco guitar builder and player. Also made electrics. If you've ever seen the film of Pink Floyd and Abbey Road, you know, the gorgeous panning shots around the equipment. I think it was from the Pompeii movie. Anyway, the recording overdubs for um, brain damage. And Roger's prodding Dave. Have you changed the controls in your guitar, Dave? And Dave's like, well, it can't be as toppy. He's playing a Bill Lewis guitar. He used it a lot on Dark Side. Bill trained in Spain in the 1950s, worked for a guitar maker there, and then returned to BC, where he opened a shop. He became a distributor, but because he had actual building chops, he was uh, a primary resource for anyone on the West Coast who wanted to try building guitars in the 60s and 70s, during that first hippie luthery boom. Uh, I think he worked a lot with Mike Dunn, who went on to become a serious guitar building educator, there's, you know, a family tree extending from these guys a long way. And Ray Nurse, who was a serious force in the early music scene, building lutes. Maybe that's where this knot of Leonardo design came from on the label. I bet you that's Ray. Lewis also started working with loggers and was selling soundboard material to people in Spain and Japan and small builders in the U.S. and Canada. And he created one of the very first luthery supply catalogs that was full of tips and tricks alongside the product descriptions. People used to save the catalogs just for the information. Uh, this was at a time Stuart McDonald was still focused mainly on banjo hardware, but he was catering to guitar builders. I don't own one of those catalogs, but they are kind of legendary. No, please don't send me one. Hold on to it for yourself or your grandkids. That business was around for probably 10 or 15 years, and then it was sold and eventually became Luthier's Mercantile in California, and by extension, Allied Luthery, which are the other places you go to for Luthery tools. So, what does it need? This has had some work, but the work, I think, is getting old. First off, the bridge has been cut down a lot. It's currently one quarter of an inch tall, and it seems to, at some point, have gotten a split that runs all the way through from one side to the other. It may have been repaired previously, but it's not entirely level. Um, six millimeters, quarter of an inch, is about as low as you'd ever want to see 
on an acoustic bridge. I believe the bridge was re-glued at some point. The frets are low and they vary in height across the board. The lowest ones are around 25 thousandths, which can be quite difficult to play for some people. Sometimes you actually need to press harder on a low fret to get a clean note. Depends on where your fingers fall, you know, because you could be pressing into the wood before the string gets enough pressure down onto the fret. Also, they're quite flat on top, and that can cause problems too. The action is high. Not super high, but kind of getting there. 864 ths on the bass side, 6 on the treble. There's also excess relief in the neck. Uh, it's about 18 thousandths worth of bow, which is, you know, twice what I want to see. So, there's a balance to be struck. Straightening the neck will lower the action a bit, and taller frets on the board will lower it even more because they'll be closer to the underside of the strings. The question becomes, does this guitar need a neck reset? To figure that out, I have to adjust the truss rod first. We'll get the relief I want, and then we'll simulate the taller frets and see where that puts us in relationship to the top of the bridge. Will we gain enough height to allow a slightly taller bridge and some more saddle exposure? Eh, I, I kind of think not. We're sort of on the borderline. Well, don't see that every day. Doesn't look like factory equipment. It looks like the truss rod may have broken off at some point, and someone's tried to reverse the nut after cutting in some of these guys into it. It's all very odd. I'm not going to remove it. I'm going to see if it functions. Well, it actually works. Returns anyway. Okay, with some adjustment, the relief now, measured on the top of the frets, is around eight thousandths of an inch around the 6th and 7th, which is okay. I don't mind that. I've left some room for adjustment. It's a good idea to check what's going on with the surface of the board too, though. That can be a very different picture sometimes. Yeah. Massive amount of up bow. So there's going to be some planing of the surface of the fingerboard during the refret. So some calculations are in order. This is granular stuff that might be a little bit boring to those not into the nitty-gritty of it all, but it's what separates a truly predictable neck reset from one that's just based on guesswork. So it's kind of important if we want to be serious about things. Knowing that I'm going to flatten the fingerboard, or portions of it, during a refret, I can alter the neck angle. Uh, if I measure the relief here on the board where it's at its greatest, around the 7th and 8th frets, using the notch straight edge and measuring on the actual fingerboard, not the tops of the frets, because there is quite a difference. I see that it's 16 thousandths, or 0.4 millimeters. I take that measurement with a guitar tipped up into playing position, by the way, because that can affect the readings. Knowing that, I can then take off that much, that 16 thousandths, off at the nut end when I'm sanding, essentially tipping the plane of the neck back, because the scooped effect comes up here, right? So if I take that part away and make this flat from here to here, it's essentially tipping the neck like this. As we've discussed in weeks past, this is like a teeter-totter effect. It's effectively raising the other side up an equal amount. So at the saddle, it's as if it was coming up um, 16 thousandths, and lowering the action, measured at the 12th fret, half that amount. So the action would come down 8 thousandths, 0.2 millimeters, which is about half a sixty-fourth. Then, on top, we can add the extra height from the new frets, which will likely end up being about fifteen thousandths taller on average. Again, 0.4 millimeters, another sixty-fourth. In which case, the action would end up being five and a half sixty-fourths on the bass side, about four on the treble. Beautiful. So in this scenario, with just a refret, I could get great action if that was all we wanted. Is it enough, though? You know, we'd still end up with virtually no saddle exposure on a bridge that's too low for optimal sound. To get the absolute best out of this instrument is, you know, what I've been asked to do, and for that we do need the neck reset. And the one other measurement you often see me taking is this one, where I run the straight edge along the top surface of the frets and see where that ends up relative to the front surface of the bridge. 
take a measurement like that, then remove the string tension and see what happens. Oftentimes there is a compressive effect from the string tension which will sort of arch the back of the guitar and push down at the front and that can change the, the angle slightly. I can tell that if the bridge ends up being slightly lower without string tension that I need to add a corresponding amount to the neck reset so that um, when we're done the straight edge is going to come to just over the top surface of the bridge. I want it to be sort of in line or maybe just a little bit above. That will give me what I consider the proper amount of saddle exposure. This appears to be a fairly early Fishman pickup which can be quite difficult to push back down into the guitar. They're, at, they're built at right angles. Um, coming up is not a problem because this is fairly rigid, but if you go back and try and bend it to force it down the hole, oftentimes you'll break the connection. And these are really, really difficult to solder back together because it's a film. It's not like wire. It yeah. So we don't want to do that. It's much easier, I think, to uh, undo the strap button, pull it up as far as you can get it into the sound hole, clip it off or desolder it, and then pull it out that way and resolder it after you're done. Because breaking one of these things is like, you know, a hundred and thirty dollar sort of mistake you don't want to make. Yeah, it's really tight. To the point where I'm going to need some lubrication, I think. Several minutes later, after using soft jaw pliers and adjustable wrench and brute force of all kinds, I've come to the conclusion this must have been cross-threaded at some point because there's no way it's coming off. So maybe we put on a brand new jack when the time comes. Bye-bye. There'll be just enough length left to do that, hopefully. Now that the shop is all smelling of liquid wrench, which is a truly detestable fragrance, I'm going to remove the bridge. You can see light through the saddle slot along that crack, and measuring at its thickest point, this is about 238 thousandths, which is just a hair over 6 millimeters. I roughed out a bridge blank and went looking through my stash of templates to see if I had anything even close, and what do you know, 1976 J45, which matches quite well. These bridges should all have come off the same shaper template, but there are inconsistencies suggesting they may have been sanded to shape by hand on something like a drum sander. They're also not particularly symmetrical, ever. One wing will be longer than the other, and there's some weird bumps and stuff on the curve. Got another case here where the center line of the top does not match the center line of the bridge. Um, it's been shifted over like two and a half, three millimeters towards the treble side. Here's the center line here and you can see how much closer it is to the D string than the G string. So if I'm going to have the bridge pin holes end up in the same place, I have to realize that the line I put on the bridge is not going to be in its center. That's unreliable. Here's a shot of the interior showing the double X pattern bracing, which completely surrounds the bridge plate on all four sides. And the bridge plate itself has pinholes that are all blown out. Big chunk of veneer flew off. Yes, this is a piece of plywood rather than solid wood. No, that's not the best idea Gibson ever had. So there are times when we make do with the unpretentious off-brand version of a name brand tool. Other times the off-brand version doesn't exist and we have to make our own. A few years back Stuart MacDonald came out with a little device called the Bridge Saver which is perfect for occasions such as this that I'm dealing with. It cuts little plug holes in a bridge plate from inside the guitar, and it comes with a purpose ground uh, plug cutting bit to make the corresponding plugs. I think 
everyone looked at it and said, boy, that's a great idea. You know, there are times when the bridge plate isn't totally mangled, and you don't want to take the whole thing out. Uh, other times you've seen me put on um, thin wood repair plates on top of the damage, uh, which does add, you know, a tiny, tiny little extra bit of mass and thickness. I've never sensed a deleterious effect from those, because I make them just big enough to do the job. I don't sense a difference in volume or tone, and uh, they certainly make it easier to string. Recently, I've seen other people basically do epoxy pores into the cavity of, uh, like, the damage. After clamping a block across the holes, they, they basically pour the epoxy in through the uh, pinholes, and you get to redrill them, and away you go. When you're dealing with a very valuable collector's guitar, there's a contingent that frowns upon removing the original bridge plate. Making wood plugs that inlay into it is, like, the least obtrusive solution. Then you get something like we have here. Pulling one of these bridge pads out is just a nightmare. It's hours upon hours of work carving into it until you can maybe get a pallet knife in, because it's so thick that heat doesn't really want to penetrate efficiently and get at the glue. To be honest, the cleanest way is probably to pop off the lower X braces so you can reach the edge and work it in like you would a normal bridge plate. But that's where the bridge saver comes in handy. Plugging it with wood is the most efficient way to deal with it, in terms of time and money. Um, the problem is that thing costs 300 bucks Canadian, which is a rather big capital expense that takes a long time to recoup. So when I needed one, I made my own out of a $30 countersink set. I ground the taper out of the countersink portion, uh, an operation probably best performed on a machinist's tool grinder setup, which I don't have. So I used my platen sharpener. Um, you could also use a belt sander. And then I, you know, used a small ceramic hone. Um, so there's this half inch stop collar to limit the depth of the cut. And um, it's reversed on the drill bit. It's a 3 16 inch bit. So, you know, you can buy flat bottomed counter bores for this purpose. They're a bit more expensive. So I feed this up from inside, um, and I operate a drill on the outside, which is going in reverse, and it cuts a reasonably neat, reasonably flat-bottomed hole, um, into which I can insert half-inch plugs. When I'm done, I come back and I sand them level. These things are about maybe half a millimeter proud of the surface, so it's not hard to sand them. The Stumac version is obviously going to be more refined and probably does a better job, but this works well enough for my purposes that I haven't found a need to purchase that one yet. I drill and plug holes 1, 3, and 5, let those dry, and then come back and do holes 2, 4, and 6. So they're overlapping. Much better. No extra added mass or thickness. Here I'm sanding the bottom surface of the bridge so it matches the soundboard. I'll loosen the fingerboard extension. Out comes the 15th fret. I don't have to worry about saving it this time. It'll introduce the holes. Before I take the neck off, I'll reinstall the bridge. In go the foam cutters. There's a piece of binding here which seems to be stuck to the front edge of the heel. With the bridge as far off center as this one happens to be, there's a good possibility that this neck was shimmed heavily, uh, maybe on one side, which could have pushed it to, you know, one side of the pocket. The shims that they were using sometimes are the um, black fiber material that was used for headstock facings, which is very compressible. And um, run into issues with that because it gets really tight on one side. And uh, so they don't really want to release at the same time. One side will stick and the other will open. So we shall see. It's taking a little longer, but it's starting to loosen. 
You don't want to put too much force. This wriggling back and forth is very controlled on my part. Uh, the dovetail is kind of a delicate thing, and if parts of it are still adhered to the sides of the mortise, um, those parts are going to want to break off if you do this too vigorously. Now this is just a gentle side-to-side -side rocking motion. You can see that a fairly large gap is starting to appear along the upper edge and the bottom of the heel is fairly loose as well. At this point I'll put on a little bit more pressure. On the bottom of the heel. I think it's probably ready to come out. As I've mentioned in the past, it's a good idea to hold on to the wire element when you pull them loose in case there's any glue on here which uh, could cause it to come off. The white glue that Gibson was using in the 70s is extremely stretchy stuff. Hide glue at this point probably would have cracked and just released but this is going to stretch So I have to push it a lot more than I would on a Martin. On this side you can see that the binding is holding fast to the front of the heel. I'll try and get a blade in between there and separate that. It's this little piece of binding which is pressing up hard against the side of the dovetail. It's really holding on there. I clamped a little block on that to hold it down. No, it's going to break off I think. The hazards of doing this on a guitar with deteriorating celluloid. Sometimes it's just going to happen. That's amazing it's this stuck this far out of the pocket and it's still so stuck. Come on. Well, okay. So, I've got binding and purfling stuck on the inside here. But there isn't any shim, which is surprising to me. Hmm. Well, at least it's out. Okay, upon a minute's reflection, I think I've figured out what happened here. This is a 1970s three-piece neck. So you've got a central part and two wings. And the dovetail was cut directly through into the center part. So this edge of the dovetail is separate from the center block and under heating and pulling it has moved forward in the pocket effectively wedging uh, the heel in there firmer and further the farther we pushed it out. So you can see it's actually proud on one side now. Um, I'm going to have to heat that up and try to push it back in place and then use a couple of dowels I imagine through the sidewall and enter the center part to uh, prevent that from moving again. They're always a surprise. Can we talk about deteriorating binding? Yes we can. Celluloid rod is a real thing and a lot of 1970s guitars are starting onto that journey. Is there anything that can be done short of rebinding this? Uh, not really. You can try using um, thin super glue that in there but you know it's kind of a, a stopgap measure. Why not rebind it? Because that is a huge annoying very expensive job. Um, I filmed one of those a year or two ago I think. It just it's no fun and doing it cleanly like really cleanly where you're not messing up the finish is well it takes forever. There are certain expensive Gretsch guitars out there from the early 60s basically require you to um, disassemble the whole instrument in order to rebind it. There is some evidence that airing the guitar out frequently can slow down or perhaps even stop the process. You want to open the case every so often to 
let out the binding flatulence. This one is not in a terrible state yet. Hopefully it stays this way for many years to come. Um, might put in some super glue when we're done in the crispier places. See the cracked and delaminating areas here? The white stuff is actually an air bubble uh, between the lacquer and the plastic underneath. So we find little cracks and we get in there with the super glue. And uh, it'll flood. Hold them together. You know, let that dry. Come back with uh, some fine sandpaper and can sand it. But even this is a kind of a long process to do a whole guitar. Bridge heater. Okay, that pushed back to basically flush. A um, little crack like this, not a worry because I'm going to be putting a piece of veneer on either side anyway. Um, because I'm going to have to increase the thickness of this. I put in some 1 inch dowels just for a little extra security. Once again, I'm pulling sandpaper to improve the neck angle, tip it backwards. I glue the neck back on. Here I'm cutting the saddle slot. I dress the board. You can see the extent of the play wear. This naturally happens with low frets. The new ones uh, ended up being almost 20 thousandths of an inch taller half a millimeter or so. Put these in here. Because there's an under saddle pickup at play here, I don't want this quite as tight as I would normally make it um, because I want all of the pressure to go right down onto the pickup rather than get hung up in the sidewalls. So this has to be a little bit looser. I'll drill the hole for the pickup wire. I'll solder on the new jack with my soldering iron. Some days, for whatever reason, I just get really lucky with the leveling beam when preparing the board. I only had to sand off, well, it was less than four thousandths of an inch to get the frets all in plane. The coronation part of the program proceeds as I crown these with many crowns. Polishing, shing, 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 shing. I made a new nut. The frets were so tall the old one wasn't going to function. All right, I'm pretty happy with this one. There's a major sonic improvement to my ears. Uh, it's like someone turned the mid-range back on. I guess the someone is me. Taller bridge, taller saddle, more brake angle equals more sound, basically. A more complex and satisfying sound. It is um, a 1970s Gibson J50, so, you know, yeah, it's 50 years old. It's 50. It likes to kick and stretch and kick. Let me strum it for a while.